Welcome to Lexpert TV. I'm Tim Wilbur, the managing editor of Lexpert Magazine. Joining me is Alethea Au, a partner in the Mergers and Acquisitions Group with Steichman Elliott in Toronto. Alethea will be speaking to us about representation and warranty insurance and its use as a transactional risk management tool. Welcome, Alethea. Thanks, Tim. I'm happy to be here. My first question is, can you give me a synopsis of the current M&A market? Hi, Tim. I'm happy to do that. Um, I think the current M&A market is the year started out very much like the, the previous year. There's been lots of activity, uh, still very active cross-border and domestically. Um, I think we have gone past the COVID and pandemic sort of uncertainty over the last two years, which really were did not detract from M&A activity at all. Um, I think the current um, scenario in Ukraine is, is something that everybody's trying to assess, but it seems like at least in the immediate effect, it does not seem to have had um, uh, on an overall level uh, much impact on the M&A side. Uh, I think growth investment continues to be um, very active too. So we're seeing um, cross-border wise, a lot of uh, activity in that space, even if it is not an outright acquisition, there's uh, certainly a lot of interest in uh, Canadian tech companies. Can you tell me why representation and warranty insurance is an increasingly important tool for managing transactional risk? Yeah, it's been, rep and warranty insurance has been around for a while, but I think in the last, really in Canada, especially in the last um, four or five years, it's really picked up. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one of which is just the maturity of the market. Um, it's become uh, that the, the insurers are more sophisticated as to what um, the insured is looking for. Um, another piece is uh, price. Um, it the, the price of the insurance uh, has dropped um, from when it was first introduced, you know, quite a few years ago. Uh, I think that the, the, the flip side of that is because there's been so much demand on it, um, the pricing for that has actually increased uh, over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, but in terms of their uh, utility to M&A transactions, um, it speeds up the transaction significantly. Um, there used to be a lot of time spent negotiating the rep and warranty uh, package between buyer and seller in terms of the allocation of risk. Uh, being able to introduce uh, an insurer into the process has allowed uh, buyers and sellers to get to the closing and the end point a lot faster. There's a lot more familiarity now with the product. So I think both buyers and sellers are used to, to, to having this product kind of backstop some of that risk. So it helps in the negotiations between them on the risk allocation. It's also been helpful that uh, insurers have generally, I think, been um, quite responsive to claims made, which of course is a big part of, of actually having the insurance because nobody's going to buy it if the claims aren't going to be uh, paid out. So that's been helpful as well to, to sort of the, the, in, uh, in, the integral nature of this product for these transactions. And one last thing is that, you know, because a lot of our clients and buyers and sellers are uh, private equity funds, um, the ability for them to disperse these funds to their uh, limited partners and their investors uh, is important. And this product allows them to do it much quicker uh, because they no longer have any um, escrow period they need to worry about. Thank you. And what are the most significant trends you're seeing for this kind of insurance? I think in terms of trends for the insurance, uh, there's, like I mentioned before, a lot of uh, sophistication. When we first, uh, they've been able to tailor the product to the M&A market uh, quite a bit. Uh, in, and we've seen this, especially during the pandemic, they were able to respond to uh, the risks that were posed to the, to the, to the, 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 the product itself um, in terms of what they were able to insure with the COVID risk. So, you know, we used to see the insurers used to provide these broad exclusions from um, COVID related risks. And we've seen a lot of tailoring and a lot of their responsiveness from it. Um, they are also much more sophisticated, in, especially for tech companies in looking at the key areas of risks. So things like for tech companies, which is most of my, my, my space that I the work, the space that I work in, uh, cyber and privacy is very important. Um, 
tax is another area. And then, you know, sometimes export compliance and, and sanctions compliance is also another important area for these companies. Great. So you identified some of the key risk areas for due diligence. Can you elaborate a bit on those? For tech companies, I think because it's so software related and so a lot of information sort of related and, and dense type of uh, businesses, cyber and privacy are key. And, and these breaches tend to have a lot of uh, bad publicity associated with it. Um, and we are also aware that the uh, attacks and, and hacks are increasingly sophisticated. So for a buyer, the it's really important to know the scope of this risk. Um, and it could depend on, on the target, right? If the target doesn't actually have much personal information, then you know the risk resulting from a breach from a privacy perspective is probably relatively low. If, um, and this happens for a lot of like software SaaS companies where they're really just providing a platform. They don't own the information, they don't store the information, they don't handle the information. So that helps. And, and the insurers are sophisticated to enough to kind of assess that risk accordingly. Um, the other piece is like nowadays, they really expect a lot of companies to have cyber insurance um, and their coverage uh, on the rep and warranty side is usually no broader than and only in excess of the existing cyber insurance. So that gives the insurers a bit of comfort as well. Uh, another area is tax. So for um, a lot of software companies, they, they use a lot of contractors. And you know, there's also a very um, uh, international workforce. People typically can work anywhere, especially with you know, what COVID has 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 um, has of how that has affected the way we work. So there are sometimes tax risks associated with it. So if you misclassify um, a, uh, a contractor, so instead they really are an employee, then you may be liable for certain withholding taxes. Uh, depending on the jurisdictions you operate, there could be specific tax implications. Um, insurers tend to shy away from jurisdictions where they think there's a bit of risk and where there hasn't been a lot of due diligence. And the last one is a little bit unique and it's, you know, it's come up a couple of times, but mostly in the context of uh, software companies um, that I've dealt with. And um, this is in the area of uh, sanctions compliance and export compliance. So if your software has encryption involved there, you know, you need to be aware of certain, you know, compliance obligations. And then for a lot of software companies, they are kind of startup and, and they grow very, very fast. So when they're looking for capital, they may not always be aware of kind of sanctioned entities or sanctioned countries. And if your capital comes from those countries, there could be kind of ongoing liability arising from it, especially if they remain still an investor uh, in the company. How should lawyers advise their clients considering this kind of insurance for their transactions? I think the... One thing to assess is the likelihood of any exclusions to the policy and, and the insurance that the insurer is able to provide to the reps and warranties. Uh, if you're in a highly regulated industry or if you're involved in certain industries that are, uh, let's say, have a higher risk profile, getting rep and warranty insurance may not be that useful for you because the insurer would typically carve out those kinds of risks because they cannot themselves get comfortable with it. So areas like that are like, um, you know, biomedical type um, areas, pharmaceuticals, uh, cannabis is some insurers shy away from cannabis, not all, but, but some do. Um, so those ones, I think is something that the, the, the council can discuss with their client if that's an appropriate route to go to, um, to factor into their risk allocation. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, given the how robust the market has been and how um, how how much M&A activity there is, especially in the last, I'd say, you know, six to 12 months, the time to get rep and warranty insurance has increased. Uh, the insurers and the brokers themselves have um, resource constraint uh, uh, issues like they it's hard to it's hard to, to have the time to place all the policies. And so it may just take more time to get a policy in place. So something to keep in mind as we, you know, as, as council kind of factor in the transaction timeline. What are your predictions for this market in the short and long term? I think in the short term, we'll continue to be very busy. I think uh, the, the, the pricing increase in the uh, cost of these policies, which have gone up uh, 
in a material way, I'd say, in the last six months. We probably will continue to see that over the next, you know, three to six months as well. But I think there will be a new equilibrium that will come into play perhaps in the longer term as what I'm seeing is uh, strategic buyers who have done the diligence, who know the space, who know the industries, who know the kind of customers there are. They are now trending towards self-insuring. So they say, you know, before the product was great and it was, you know, it was at a lower cost and price point. Uh, but now because of the factors I mentioned, such as a longer time to, to put a policy in place and the higher cost, some of them are willing to just self-insure and renegotiate the traditional kind of indemnification uh, packages. So I think in the, in the long term, like there, I think we'll see um, continued sophistication by the insurers. And that comes from like additional claims history, right? They, they're seeing where, they're, where their risk is and where they're less now willing to step up depending on the, the nature of the target and the diligence performed. And because of this um, ability of strategic buyers to self-insure, I think we'll see a new equilibrium towards, you know, a stabilization of the pricing and increased sophistication from the, from the insurers. Thank you for joining us today, Alethea, and thank you for watching Lexpert TV.